Let's pray. Our gracious Father, Lord, uh, truly our strength comes from you, uh, Lord, as we uh, consider all that you've done and uh, what you continue to do in our lives, Lord. Uh, Father, I pray for continued strength for each of us, uh, Lord, that we would submit ourselves unto you, uh, drawing, drawing closer in, in every aspect of our lives. And Father, as we consider your word today, as we consider uh, the closing of our journey through the book of Romans, uh, Lord, we, we look at what Paul has written, and Father, I pray that we would apply it into our lives, that we would learn uh, the lessons uh, and, and gear our lives towards submitting and, and obeying you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, you may not know this, but I'm fairly sure this is kind of an obvious thing with me. I am easily distracted. Um, and, and really, to the point of where it's, it's almost, there's medication for people like me. I, I call it coffee. Um, but it, easily distracting, and, and I see this, I didn't realize how distracted I was until, um, really, I, I, my oldest son uh, is, is very similar to me, and I, as I'm dealing with him, and I, why is this kid not paying attention? And my wife will say, well, he's just like you. And so easily distracted, we'll get caught off of the guard and do things. And that's dangerous when it comes to uh, the mission uh, uh, for Christ. But it's also dangerous in our own lives. And many of you, I think, probably suffer from one of the same things I do, and that's textitis. And as you're driving your car, you feel the, the, the phone rings, and you look at it, and they go, I shouldn't touch it, but I, I have to. Because there's this com cult compulsion in our lives, i got to see what such and such had to say. And so we'll pick it up, and we'll be texting. And we'll text, and then we'll look. Because I just got to read it for a second. Oh, geez, that deserves an answer right now. And we get we got to an answer. And it's a problem for many of us. Well, there's some statistics on texting while you're driving and, and just general cell phone use. Uh, if you text while you're driving, it makes you 23 times more likely to crash. Uh, drivers talking on a cell phone are four times more likely to have a car accident. Talking on a cell phone while driving make you, makes young drivers' reaction time as slow as that of a 70-year-old. I don't know what I think about that. It's, what is that saying about the poor 70-year-olds? I think it's get off the road. I'm coming through. That's, no, that's not what that means. But that's, that's, a, that's pretty, because it's impacting your, your time there. Uh, answering text takes away uh, your attention for about five seconds. That's enough time to travel the length of a football field. I didn't know that. That's a long ways you're traveling not looking at the road. Um, again, in 2012, uh, there were 3,328 people killed in distraction-related crashes. About 421,000 people were injured in crashes involving a distracted driver. And uh, also in 2012, nearly half of drivers admit to answering their cell phone while driving. Of those, 50%, 58% continue to drive while talking on the phone. And I somehow manage every time I get in the car to be behind one of them. Um, on this, in the survey in 2012, 24% of drivers reported they're willing to make a phone call while driving. Uh, one in 10 drivers surveyed said that at least sometimes they send text messages or emails while driving. And I, I sadly admit that I fall in that last bunch. But I have found this wonderful text and this device on my cell phone where I can just push it and I can speak into it. And so I figure that makes me okay. I'll just continue. No, that's not okay. But what happens there is we get distracted. When we get in the car, we're generally going, I'm going from wherever I'm starting to wherever I'm going. And for me, I want to get there as fast as possible. And so we, we have this mission in mind. If I'm going to the donut shop, I want to get there quickly because I got to get there before the other people because they'll eat all the good donuts. And, and I want to get, you know, the... the, the the fritters, the apple fritters. And so I go there, and if I'm late, then I, I don't get the apple fritters. So we want to go as quickly as possible. Now imagine you're driving down the road, and you got all these people texting and all this, and they're looking down, and boom, you're crashing. Yeah. See, that happens a lot, and we get that when it comes to that, but it's the same thing that happens in our lives when we're on mission for Christ. Many times there are things within the world that take our eyes off of the road, off the mission that God's called us to. We're not going the direction. We're not going uh, how God has called us to do it. And really, as we focus in on the closing of the book of Romans, we're going to look at what Paul is going to identify here. And really for us, I want us to look at this as Paul as the pastor identifying his mission and what he's about to continue on in doing, but also what he states to the, the folks there at the Roman church. If you have your Bibles, turn with me uh, to Romans chapter 15. We won't read in the entirety uh, the end of chapter 15 and all of chapter 16, but we will read a couple of chunks. Uh, we'll start off in chapter 15, verse 14, and we'll read through a little bit there, talk about what's going on, talk about how we apply that, and then we'll jump in and, and complete the rest of the book. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 15, and we'll begin in verse 14. 
I, my, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of the anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of the signs and wonders and by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, uh, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for the many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to also in the service, uh, be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this, and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will be come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. And so we'll, we'll kind of see, parse this out a little bit and, and see what's going on and how uh, this impacts us. Anytime, though, when I think of Paul, especially uh, when I think of Paul as a pastor, there's always a verse that comes into my mind that, that rings really loudly. And I, I think this is applicable not only uh, to us as, as pastors and those elders that, that uh, really kind of meet that same criteria, but every man in the room ought to be able to say this in his home. And, th and that is in 1 Corinthians 11.1 uh, where Paul states, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And I think that's something that all too often we, we glance past and say, oh, that's interesting. But, and we apply that to Paul, but we never really bother to look at our own lives and what has God designed us to function as. And so it's easy to lay that out and say, well, that's the pastor's job, be an imitator of him. But I think you, every one of us needs to really heavily consider what does that look like? Can I say to others, be an imitator of me? Can you imitate me as I am imitating Christ? Do I look enough like Christ that you would want to imitate me? And I think that's a fascinating thing. And, and as we consider what Paul's writing here as he's closing up here, uh, this book of Romans, some of the things he's stating about his mission and where he's going, I think it's important for us to look at. But it always brings to me, if I asked you what, what is a pastor, almost everybody would have an answer. And most of us would be fairly in the ballpark of it. But as we consider Paul, I, I really want to look at this and identify what does it mean as we consider Paul as a pastor and how do we look at that in our lives and what do we expect of our pastors? And, and so I think as we look at this, we have to start with God as the pastor, God as the shepherd. In Isaiah 40, 11, we see this. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. And so we have this, he's carrying uh, the lambs, he's carrying them close to him, and loving them, and he's gentle with them, those who are young. Now that's contrary, I don't know that I like that, because I like to be in the pastor with, when you see the shepherd with a stick. That's the pastoral role I like, I like to chase you around and hit you. No, I don't like to do that. But that's, that's real, when we look at God as the good shepherd, that's what we're looking at, that's the model, and as Paul states this, imitate me as I imitate Christ, that's what we're going to look at, and we should see that bared out in his life. We also see uh, from a human perspective what a humanly uh, is written here, and there's multiple places in the Bible, but I'm just going to focus in on a couple. 1 Peter chapter 5, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, I, I look at this in, in terms of, there's some specific things, and there's this contrast that we're presented with here by Peter. 
Exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but it's a willing exercise of this. Of this. And how interesting, and, and we're celebrating Father's Day today, and, and how interesting it is that in our culture there are so many absent fathers. There's, there's this missing piece within the family. And, and it's this, not under, they're not doing it even under compulsion, but they're not willing to do this. And I think that's a travesty and a statement of the, the impact uh, that's going to have upon the people in this culture. You know, it's interesting, we look at that, this has got to be a willing thing. I, I, you know, most of you know I have seven children. I did that unwillingly. It wasn't until this last one I figured out, how does this work? <laughs> No, but it's this design, you, you do this, and really when you look at this as a shepherd, it's not this compulsion, i got to do this, it's I find great joy in this. And when we look at this in terms of the dynamics within the body of Christ, it's not this compulsion to do it, I just want to do it for whatever reason, it's I'm willing to do this because this is what God's called me to do. And men and fathers and, and husbands, I look at this and, and I look to you, this is what God, you have a role in your home, that's what God has called you to do. Do that willingly out of your obedience to God. And secondly, we also see, not, uh, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. How interesting, if I, if I mention some names of, of televangelists, all of a sudden feelings start rolling in. One of the reasons we don't hit on, on tithes and offerings very heavily, except when it comes up in the Word of God, is because there have been so many that have perverted it before we came and that's one of the things they've, they've basically spoiled it, it all. They poisoned the well. And so he can't even mention, and I know people in my own life, if they came in here and I mentioned money, that would be the last time they showed up. And it wouldn't matter how godly it was in the presentation. Even Paul states he's taking the funds, and they, they, it's good that they gave these funds to go to Jerusalem. They owe it to them. But how interesting, this isn't a, a job or a task for somebody who's desiring to, to make some kind of a gain. I can tell you, nobody here getting rich doing ministry. That's, that's the truth at, at this church, and it's the truth at every, every God-fearing and, and, and Bible-teaching church that I know of. Nobody's getting rich. It's out of this desire to see those who are lost come to Christ and to see those who are Christ to grow in Christ. And it's this desire to be obedient to God. And one of the things they tell you in pastor school, uh, which they call seminary, some people call it uh, the cemetery, <laughs> is if you can do anything else in the world and find joy, go do it. This is your last option. And, and the reason they say that is because if you find anything else, you get into this pulpit and you start dealing with the stuff that's going on because you, you get in people's lives and it gets messy, you're going to find a way out. If this is where you, this is the only place, and i got to be honest, this is the only place, other than working with my family, of course. Well, no, this is the only place. Oh. No. I love my family. They're fantastic. She's out there again, so I can say whatever I want. It's, no, but what we look at here is, is really the, the greatest joy is in doing this. And there's nothing else, really. I, you gotta look at it, and that's all, you ought to be able to expect that not only from your pastors but leaders. And you ought to also look at that within your own homes as husbands and fathers. Do you find great joy in that? If not, then are you willing to submit to God? Because he can turn that into joy. And if not, maybe you're approaching this wrong. And then finally, being examples to the flock, not domineering over those. And how, how easy that is uh, when you get into some kind of authority. Everybody, I, I'm almost confident everybody in here has had a bad boss. Pounding you over, pounding you over the head with, with whatever. They're domineering. But the reality is what we should do is, is you're not, you don't need to do that. But you've got to be an example. I can't tell you how many times I've heard fathers complain about their kids. <laughs> and then I watch what they do. And the kid's doing exactly the same thing. And I, I've seen that even in my own home, where I, I look at my kids and say, why are you doing this? And then my wife will kind of snicker. And later on, when I do the same thing, she'll say, why are you doing this? And the kids showed me how. <laughs> That's my go-to now. That's a great excuse. But what ends up happening is that the people in the, within your charge, those who you've been placed in, in this pastoral role of, or, or those of you in the home, and, and I, let me take a sidestep and, and address an issue real quick. The, the reality in America is there are guaranteed there are people in here who don't have fathers or husbands in their home. Guaranteed. That's just the way the statistics work. And women, if that's you, I'm sorry. You get a double role. And that's when men fail to step up, what, we're, what are we left with? The women, women generally will step up and deal with it. But we've got a, a culture full of 
I don't have a real gentle way of saying this, panty waist men. We've got a culture of boys that aren't willing to step up and be a man. Women, I'm sorry. It's your fault you ate the apple. <laughs> no, that's not, that's no excuse at all. The reality of it is, is we have it. Now, men in the church, you have to understand this is happening in the culture. Some of these kids, I do King's Kids, and, and we have guys that go out and do uh, the stuff with the, the, the kids out there. We do VBS, and I have great joy. And one of the most fun things is I get to deal with your kids and fill them with candy. And send them on their way. And that's fun. But sometimes we have to remember. Sometimes we're the only godly example of what a father, what a husband, what a man is. That's not a light order for us. And women, if you're in that, that position, you have the responsibility of training your young boys to be men. That's almost impossible. But with God, I would say all things are possible. And so we have to look at that. And, and so as I speak in this, I want you to understand I'm aware of that issue. But, but also, we have to look at this in terms of the design behind the church and function here, too, as, as what we're talking about with this pastoral piece. And so, as we go on in Acts, we also see some instruction. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained for his own glory. And I look at this in terms of how I was just at a pastor's conference, or pastor's meeting, um, and, and it's, it's fun for me to get together with other pastors, by the way, and I'll talk more about this in a second, because I get to brag, usually, when I go to these things, because you guys are awesome. And, and these poor saps in other churches, man, they got problems. <laughs> I should pray for them, because I, I hear some of their problems, and man, that sucks. <laughs> Let me tell you what great things are happening at Crossroads. Uh, but, but what happens here, oftentimes, is we have to remember, and, and this is very tempting, because we are made of flesh, and we have this sin nature. So there are times when I look at, when people will ask, how's your church doing? So, well, my church is doing great. But I have, to, I have to take a step back and remember, this is, you're God's people. This is God's church. I'm just the guy here for this season. Ten years from now, 20 years from now, who knows who's going to be in the pulpit. There will be a point where I'm less effective than somebody else, or, or God will call me out of this role and somebody else will step in. But more on that in a little bit. But we have this notion and understanding that finally, uh, of this, this design behind what a shepherd should look like. There's also this piece of zeal and compassion. And, and one of the things that you may not know is there is a, a very, I, I never had this experience until really as we planted Crossroads, myself and, and David and a few others, we planted church. I didn't, I got to be careful how I say this because I don't want to sound like I, I'm just a big jerk, which you all know is true. I, I really have a hard time caring about people. I mean, I, I have a very good ability to just kind of step back and say, well, you suck, and go off with my life. But it was when I, we started doing this that there was this compulsion and this desire to help the, the people of, of God's church. And I don't know where that comes from, and I don't know why that's there, because sometimes it bugs the crud out of me. I wish I didn't care sometimes. But the reality of it is, is now, it's this point of where, I, I really, this design and the zeal to see you grow in Christ... <laughs> And to see you uh, embed yourself within the body of Christ and grow and put the gifts that he's given you into, into action and watch the impact of Christ in your life. I had an interesting phone call this week where I got to, I got to experience God at work and I get to see this all the time, but it's always fun. I, I, we have this list and, and if you're new, I, I call you every, about every couple weeks just kind of check in and see how things are going. And, and I hadn't called and I'd been so busy, I hadn't called, I thought, well, I got to call this, folks. And God really put on my heart, call such and such. Like, okay, I'll call. And so I'm, I'm calling, and kind of I'm flying by the seat of my pants. i got to get out the door, so I make a phone call. And they thought they called me. I don't know who, who I, I answered, they answered the phone and said, hey, is this such and such? No, no, this is, and they thought, it's, for some reason they thought they called me or had some kind of, I, I didn't know who it was. Somebody else answered the phone, and, and so I'm talking, and they said, well, you know, I, this is why I called. And this is what they're telling me. And I thought, well, I called you. And I said, you know, God says, keep your mouth shut, stupid. I said, okay. And so they tell me, I called you because we need a fridge. And I thought, hey, I've got a fridge sitting in my garage that I need to get rid of. And, and it's, it's interesting to watch how God does this. And then I get the opportunity to go and deliver this and, and spend a little bit of time with folks. But these are the things that are fantastic because then I get to be a part of this miracle and watch what God just did to them, providing some simple need. Handing out clothing to people. I mean, these are simple things. But we look at this in terms of what does it do? It, it, it brings people closer to Christ. It allows them to know, hey, God does give a rip. 
And he cares about you enough that he's going to provide some of these things. And that's one of the fascinating things. And so we, we get this zeal and this desire and this compassion to watch people grow. And you see this, and I'm going to go back to 2 Corinthians again a little bit later, but in 11.2, Paul says, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Speaking of this church that's got some significant issues. And the design behind it is, I want you to grow in Christ so that you can stand before him and I'll say, you're well done. And it's Amway. I get some of that credit. <laughs> Bill gets a little bit. We spread it out among the elders. <laughs> so, no, but that's this zeal and this desire because I know what sin will do in your life and I, I don't want you to suffer. I don't want you to get hit over the head by sin. And so it's this desire, this zeal for this. <clears throat> How do we not expect that of our pastors? How do we not expect that of leaders? And I look at, the, I look at Paul and we look at his letters and we understand that. But how do we not expect that also of fathers? Fathers, ought we not have that same zeal to see our children, to see our families grow in Christ? We know the potholes because most of us walked down the road and stepped in them. Yep. And so we know what all that is. And, and so we look at this and think, well, I don't want them to do that. And so I have to model my life so that they'll follow and they'll understand what this looks like. <laughs> and so we get, get to this point of where Paul identifies and says that he's, that he's proud. And, and this is often in, in Christendom, this is a bad word. We don't want to mention pride because pride's an evil thing. It's, it's a sin. But Paul is proud of them. And how interesting. For, for me, I think of that and think, oh, that's amazing. Paul's proud of it. Because that's not what you often hear uh, coming out of the mouths of, of pastors. It's this pride of the body of Christ. Oftentimes, even I'm guilty of this. I'll, I'll talk about the state of affairs and I'll blame the church. And I'll probably do that at some point in the sermon. The state of affairs in our culture, and we have to look at the church. What's the church doing? But Paul identifies this pride that's there. And it makes me look at this and, I, and have to ask, what are shepherds proud of? What is it within the body of Christ that we should expect that our pastors or that our elders, that our leaders would be proud of within us? First off, I think it's that there's this instilled desire to be others-focused. This instilled desire within the body to go out and to not only reach the lost, but to grow the lost. We could have a church a mile wide and an inch deep, and that's not going to do us any good. But what if we had a, a church that's not quite as wide, but much deeper? How much can we change the world then? You see, it's not only just reaching them, because I could convince any of your kids to accept Christ. I guarantee you, put them in a room with me for 20 minutes and they'll be saved. Yeah, but that doesn't mean a doggone thing. But what if we made them disciples? What if we grew them? What if we got them to the point of where they're so others focused that they not only want to grow and, and love God in their own lives, they want to see others do this? And that's really the call. As we go on, as they, they are, are people centered on God's word? So one of the, the designs behind this is can we get you centered not on just what I'm saying. Go back and check if what I'm saying is true. Go and you've got the manual in your hands. If you don't have one, I can get you one. Go back and, and know God's word. Know the answers. You, is your life centered on that? We went over last week. I said the, the body, the, the, the word of God has an answer to every question that life can throw at you. And if it's not explicitly written, it's in there. It may not say the exact word, but it's in there. The problems that you're facing have been faced by others. The circumstances in there. Everything centers back on Christ. And then finally, there's also obedience to the good shepherd. One of the things that we look for, I mean, Paul states this in word and in deed. We all can say the game. We, we can all say it. And I, hey, there, there are people that I know that can tell you, spin you a great yarn. And they'll tell you how great, oh, I love God. Da, 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 da. And, and, but then they never really, you don't see it in their lives. We look for to be proud in as people that are not only saying it, but they're living it. And then finally it all comes back to who gets the glory. Who gets the glory? And i got to tell you, one of the fascinating things here, and I, I try to give people compliments, um, and, and they never take them. Probably because I'm usually joking. Uh, well done. No. <laughs> Good one on that. I'll do it myself next time. No. <laughs> we give people, one of the fascinating things about the staff and, and the, the leadership here is, is as you give them a compliment, almost to a T, every one of them says, well, God did it. And I know, no, let me thank you. No, no, God did it. To give the glory to God because it's really His glory. Why are we doing this in the first? Why do I even have the ability to do this? Because of God. 
And so turn the glory back to him. These are the things, as we look at what, what Paul is identifying and what his pride is wrapped up in with, with this church in Rome and as well as many of the other churches, this is what he, when we look at and identify and can understand. This is what a pastor's pride would be in. This is what the flock looks like. How fascinating. And I would offer to you, fathers, does your family look like this? Because you're the pastor in your home. If I, if I can say that, you're the shepherd that God's placed there. Does your family do this? They give glory to God when things go well. They give glory to God when things go wrong. Because God is God no matter what the circumstances are. And as we consider this, I, I have to identify, and, and this brings us into this weird problem, I think, that many of us pastors and many leaders face. What does success look like? What does success look like biblically? What does success look like culturally? You know, often we have to consider that really, for us, success sometimes doesn't reflect what the Bible has stated is. And so we, we look at a, a biblical model of success, and Paul fits that model as he looks at the church and he presents it in this design uh, behind it. But I read an article, actually it was a blog about an article on uh, Christianity Today. And the, the author is, cite, is quoting a, a gentleman named Timothy Gombas, who's a, a Pauline scholar. And this, this Gombas states, if we encountered Paul today, he would not be a strong and decisive leader we often imagine. In fact, many of our contemporary churches would hardly consider him a viable pastoral candidate. And he goes on and states, evangelicals place a high priority on leadership, perhaps because historically our movement has been carried along by strong leaders. The great figures of our heritage have been powerful speakers of entire and, uh, and compelling visionaries, many of whom have built colleges, seminaries, and in some cases, entire denominations. These are also traits we want to see in our pastors. Thus, we intuitive, intuitively assume that Paul was someone just like this. We think uh, he must have been a compelling figure, a charismatic and decisive leader, and a powerful speaker from the moment of conversion. He immediately put his great abilities to, abilities to work for Christ, taking over the leadership and becoming its powerful spokesperson. But when we look at the evidence from the New Testament, we find a very different picture. And, and so when I ask, what does a pastor look like? Many of us think of these things, and, and, and we, we have this cultural dynamic and understanding of, well, this is what they should be doing. This is this powerful leader, and they, they, they've got it all together, and they figure it out, and, and God is just with them, and they go through these things that they endure, and everything is fantastic. Let me read you Paul's resume. Paul applied for a job here at Crossroads. <laughs> And this is what he says. Now, remember, he's right in the, second, the church in uh, Cor Corinth. I'll give you a little backdrop on this. The Corinth church had the super apostles coming in. And that's literally what Paul calls them in chapter, chapter I think it's 10, uh, 10 or 11, where he, he calls them the super apostles. These guys would come in with their great clothes. They, they'd look great. They'd be, uh, have their faces, you know, with the makeup and everything they do, and they charge you to hear them speak. These guys, were, and they would put Paul down because, well, well look at Paul. Here he comes in, on, if he's got a camel that week, maybe. Coming in, he's got some thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what it is. And he's got probably dirty, and all this other stuff. Probably not the best of speakers. And these super apostles will put him down. This is Paul's response as he's writing to the church in Corinth. Whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, lest one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked at night. In a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, though many a sleepless night, and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is this daily pressure on me of the anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of, our, of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. 
but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. This is Paul's resume. So here he comes in, and, and one of the questions we'll ask people, and we do this, it's every, well, tell me how you're, you've led people. Well, I went, you know, I was in these shipwrecks, and they stoned me, and, and I got beaten and whipped, and I was always in danger in this. What we would say is, thanks. We'll consider it. And then as they left, what's wrong with that guy? God ain't with him. Good grief. God, I'd never let that happen. And I offer to you, this is the requirement to be willing to do if you want to pastor a church. This is one of the reasons why in pastor school they tell you if you can do anything else, do it. And it may not be that you're in danger of being stoned. It may not be that you're in danger. And that's stuff, let me rephrase this. We live in Washington. That's not Seattle stoned or Denver stoned. This is stoned with rocks. You know, we've got this, and, and so if you want to be a leader, now the reality of it is, is that's probably not likely to happen. But are you willing to take this burden on? And fathers, it's to say, are you willing to step up to the plate? Because it's not going to be gentle, and it's not going to be about you. The reality of it is, is for us, this is always about Christ. Are you willing to step up to the plate? Are you willing to, to sacrifice of yourself? Are you willing to pay the price? You see, culturally, what we want to know is, well, how big is your congregation? What we want to know in, in these dynamics is, how much money are they bringing in? What was your last month's tithes? What's your building look like? How big is it? What programs are you running? You see, this is often what we look at in terms of this is what it makes. And we want a pastor that can do that. And we want a leader that can do that. Can I tell you that if I was busy doing all that, you'd never hear from me. I'd be this elusive creature that shows up on Sunday and preaches to you, tells you how awful you are. Or the flip side of it, tells you how wonderful you are. So in that case, I'd be lying to you. <laughs> That's your Monday morning joke. If it makes sense, you'll be running that through your head. Did he just call me awful? No, but really, what we look at here is this is the design behind it. So I have to, as we consider that and apply that into our lives, that brings us to the next step, I think, as we look at what Paul's doing. Paul was a church planter, extraordinaire. Now Rome, this church in Rome is not one he planted. And yet he's very proud of them because he's seeing what's going on with the body of Christ all throughout there. And his job was to bring salvation to the Gentiles. As he was signing up for the task, Christ said in Acts chapter 9, as he's telling Ananias to go and, and, and speak with Paul, this is, the, this is the job that I have for him, for I will show him how much he su must suffer for the sake of my name. Now if you're applying for jobs on Craigslist, and you see you will suffer for the sake of my name, that's probably one you say, ah, no, not today. <laughs> you send it off to your cousin. Hey, play for this job. <laughs> but really, we look at this, and you have to understand, this is, this is the setup for Paul, because he's got to go all in. We have to look at this, this design behind Paul is to go after these churches and build them up, this zeal and this compassion to build up elders, those who can lead the church so he can move on and continue on to spread the gospel throughout the entire region. That's fascinating because he does this, and we see it in uh, verse 19, it's from Jerusalem all the way around to Elric Erishim. I don't know how, to, I, I didn't pronounce it right. Let's go with me on it. I fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Now I want you to see what this looks like. So I got this map, but you can't tell. But what we're talking about here is down here is where it's starting, and these are his missionary journeys. This last one here is him going to Rome. This is Paul's area. This is his area of responsibility. Now, Paul didn't have cell phones. He didn't have a car that he could drive. He had a ship that would crash apparently quite a bit. <laughs> he would fall, go in his boat, and he crashes. Oh, shoot, I crashed again. Paul was a fantastic swimmer <laughs> by the end of his ministry. It makes Michael Phelps look, look foolish. But this is his area. Now, I look at that, and i got to be honest with you. As a pastor, I say, that's a big area of responsibility, even with a car. That's one of those, he's looking at this, my goodness, and this is where his burden is. This entire region. That's a lot of area. Especially you got to walk it. And I don't like to walk. People, any people here like to run, you're crazy. That's why we invented cars. 
Because these people ask me when, people want to do this right. We meet with these young adults. They say, hey, there's this slime run thing. And they, they're all in. I say, well, you guys are idiots. They're going to run. They're gonna throw, not only are you going to run, they're going to throw slime at you while you're How can you make a run worse? Let's throw slime at people. <laughs> That's the whole thing. And then they somehow convince me, yes, this will be fun, Pastor Steve. I, I told him, I told him, run around the church, I'll throw slime at you. I'll just do it for fun. But we look at this, you've got to understand, this is a large area of responsibility that I look at that and my first thought is, how in the world could somebody do that? How in the world could this, this can't possibly be, no one man can have this burden. We know that Paul has others and, and he's going to go through in chapter 16 and you've got kind of the hit makers, the, the people that are there. But we, we look at this and I have to, the question that comes to my mind is how can one person do this? Well, he doesn't. He has helpers there. But he's got this burden that we look at. But for me, as I consider that, I, I look at it and, and, and it brings to life what Paul states to the Philippian church. In chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen. And I look at that, and, and as we consider our own lives, we consider the life of this body of believers, do you know what our area of responsibility is? It has spread since we started the church. It's not just Airway Heights. Airway Heights is, is the initial and immediate vicinity. And that is part of it. But it goes all the way to the other side of Davenport. And it heads all the way to the, the, the Idaho border. That's a big area. Of now, there are other churches that are doing this, but they're not doing it nearly as well as us. <laughs> <laughs> they do a great job. But, but we look at this, and you have to understand, that's, that's it. That's a big area. It started off, you know, our, our website, I have to type in, and if you have to email me, it's Pastor Jarman at Crossroads West. But that's a lot to type in. And I, I've, been, I've been flustered by this. Why do we have this? But that is really what we're responsible for, the entire West Plains. And one of the goals and one of the missions is that everybody in the West Plains at least has an option to accept Christ. Amen. They may deny him. <clears throat> the, Paul's success, as he, as he identifies his success here, is not necessarily that everybody's accepted Christ, but that there are planted, churches planted, and they, there are people doing and, and focusing on the ministry to take the gospel out. Success is you have the option. I really, as we look at this, we, we look at the success with the church, but as we take the gospel out, does everybody have an option to at least either accept or deny Christ? And all too often I, I see us failing or, or not, not desiring or going after that. But further, do you realize that you have an area of operation? As a Christian, God has placed you wherever he's placed you in whatever community you're in, wherever you're at, whatever job you're in, you have an area of responsibility. And it starts with your home, but then it spreads out to everybody you have contact with. And that may not mean you're hitting them with the Bible in the face, although that is my proven method of leading people to Christ. Hit them in the head, and then they say, why'd you do that? Because God loves you. <laughs> and then I move on to the next one. It's very great for your aggression. works wonderfully. You are literally then a Bible thumper. <laughs> but what we have to look at here is, is you have these people in your eyes who are going to be watching you and, and they're going to say, hey, you go, you're, you're a Christian and, and when things hit and there are times in lives and windows of opportunity where you're there and you're the one God put there. There are times when you make that phone call and think you're calling for one reason and you end up where there's a whole different reason. There are windows of opportunity where you're the one who God has placed there. That is your area of responsibility. Are you willing to be it? Are you willing to be there? Are you willing to be the one? Remember at basic training, they, they put us in these little field things and you're doing this stuff where you, you had this one section. And so I, I can't remember what the name of it was because I forgot it as soon as we did it because I, I hated it. I, I, I'm not the best. I'm not a very good soldier or, or even, even airman for that matter. Uh, which airmen's kind of, you don't you do a lot of soldiery things, but I'm so bad at it that, that I can't do any soldiering stuff. And I remember I'm sitting out there, and we're, we're supposed to be shooting people as they're coming out, and, and I had one area, and this is my area, right here. And then I had another guy, and his area was right here, and another person over here. And so we had these areas, and as we'd get tired, we'd, we'd call in, and somebody else would replace us. I remember, it's 190 degrees in Texas. I'm in all this gear. I got a helmet, and I got all this stuff, and I'm calling for help, and nobody comes. And there's another guy, and we're dying. And, and I remember, I'm sitting there, and I literally thought, I'm going to die right here. I was, I was cooking from the, from the heat, and I rested my head on my gun. And I'm sitting there, 
And my eyes started to close. And I thought, I'm in trouble. Because I couldn't focus any longer on my area of responsibility. That was, I was saying, somebody's going to come in and they're going to kill us. And they're going to say, Jordan, what's wrong with you? And I'm going to say, I fell asleep. And finally, somebody comes in and relieves me. And they're coming in and they beat that area as well. But if for that moment in time, that is my area. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's the same for you. There are times when you're going to get tired. There are times when you're going to be sleeping. There are times when things are going to come up. And, and you're going to have to call for assistance. Who do you have to assist you? That's what the body of Christ is about. That's what we're here for. That's what we do. That's how this whole design is. That's how we're designed to function. Oh. And as we go on here, as we consider this, Work is hard. And I think as we read Paul's resume and we consider all the work he's done and he gets to this section here with the Roman church and he's saying, he goes through, everything's done. It's there. I've met the mission. Mission accomplished. i got one task left and that's to take these offerings back to Jerusalem to be with the saints, to help the saints there. Most of us would say, hallelujah, Paul, they'll go into retirement. Man, you earned it. And, and interestingly, I don't know if you know where retirement or, or really the, the Social Security or retirement comes from, and Social Security specifically, that's a German thing. It came out, in, and Germany was the first nation in the world to adopt an old age uh, social insurance program. It was designed by Otto von Bismarck. The idea was uh, put forward at his behest uh, in 1881. It started in 1889, but he requested it. Uh, uh, German's Emperor William wrote of this in, in 1889. Those who are disabled from work by age and invalidity have a well-grounded claim to, be, to, uh, to care from the state. And then we kind of adopted a similar program uh, in, in back in, I think it was 1934, 1935, somewhere in there, uh, is when we adopted the Social Security kind of thing, and, and we've, we've had that we're going ever since, so you pay into it, and somebody takes your money, and you hope it's there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm pretty sure it's not going to be there for me. I don't know where my money's gone, and, and somebody's enjoying it right now. But but we look at that in terms of we have this notion of retirement. If I asked you what's the retirement age, most of you'd say 65. That's right. And we have these great plans, and we sandbag our lives and gear it towards when I'm 65, I'm going to retire, and I'm going to get a Harley, and we're my wife and I we're going to cruise around the country. And we have these retirement plans, and that's it, man. I want to, that's what I want to do. I'm going to go do that, and that's, going to, that's my retirement. That's what it is. And for a lot of us as Christians, that's, what, that's when I'm going to start ministry. Because I'll have time. Can I tell you, whatever ministry you're doing now is what you're going to do when you retire from your occupation. It's not going to change. If you're not doing ministry now, you're not going to do it then. The reality of it is, is whatever you're doing now is the same thing you're going to do then. You'll buy your RV, and you'll travel around the country. Or you'll, you'll do whatever you're going to do. But, but well, realistically, for Christians, I have to look at this in terms of when do we retire from ministry? We don't. There's no retirement plan for ministry. There is this design where you will shift your focus and you'll do something different. But there is no retirement plan. We signed up for the long haul. My eternal life began when I committed myself to Christ and it never ends. When God calls me home, that's when I'll rest. But the reality for most of us, and for all of us, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, your work started that day. Your ministry started then. And it doesn't stop. That's what you signed up for. I'm sorry that they didn't tell you that. We have a way of doing that. and Just kind of telling you, just accept Him; It'll be great. No, this is ministry. And you'll find no greater joy. You'll find no, nothing, nothing will fill you up like when you work for you, you minister for Christ. And I don't say that just willy-nilly. I say that based on experience. And believe me, I committed my life to in two, when I was, when I was uh, 25. That's 25 years I lived seeking other things to find me pleasure. And there was nothing. They all ended up with just leading, ending in want. But it's when I committed my life to Christ and I began to live for Him. That's when we see, God, you're amazing. And so as we consider that, we have to look at this in terms of what is your retirement plan as a Christian? What is it, not from your occupation, because you should retire from that at some point, but what is it that you're, what is your retirement plan? Is it that you're going to, at that point, that's when I'm going to do this? Because if you're not doing it now, you're not going to do it then. I said at the beginning of this, or towards the beginning, that there will be a point when I'm not the effective guy, that God will call me out of this position. There will be some other young punk that comes in here. 
And so it, maybe it's being old guy. They'll call me out and they'll put Bill in. Oh. <laughs> it's my one shot. I gotta take a shot. He'll be up here again. He'll make fun. It's fun. That's, it's joking. But but we, we look at this in terms of somebody else would be. What do I do then? That's when I get my Harley and I no. Do you know what my retirement plan is? It's to die on the mission field. <coughs> My wife and I are both, we're all in. Can you believe that? How could some fool come up with a retirement plan like that? Because I want to see people brought to Christ. And I got years left into when God calls me home, man, that's going to be great. Because I'll say, how did I do, Dad? And they'll say, well done. That's the, but that's it. What is, your, what is your retirement plan? Have you looked at that and said, I'm going to gear my life towards living it to that's what I want to accomplish? Because that's what Paul did. And remember, he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. As we look at this, what's Paul's plan? I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and then I'm going to go to Spain. But we know he never makes it, because he dies in Rome. We know he doesn't get to accomplish that, but he's always about the work of Christ. He's always about the gospel. And for us, it's got to be our lives have got to be centered on that same thing. And that brings us to this notion of in chapter 16, I'm not going to read it in its entirety, but the opening of chapter 16 is an all-star list. These are the all-stars as Paul's listing off. This is the list you want your name in. As Paul's going through it and he ident he's identifying all these several names and, and when you come across these lists, think of this like a photo album. As you flip through the photos, you look, oh, that's them. As we read these names, these people that are receiving this letter, you go, yes, that's them. We know, we know her. This is their photo album. These are the hit makers. How did they do this? They were all in for this is the list you want your name. There are other lists you don't want your name in. Paul writes, these people abandoned me. And you don't want your name in that list, but this is the one you wanted in. And when he goes on and, and states in chapter 16, verses 17, I'll just read this, this real quickly. Verse 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. This is after he's gone through the hit list. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What's interesting is I want you to hear this. Your obedience is known to all. He's giving them another warning, but your obedience, everybody knows your obedience. This is their reputation. And what a fascinating thing to be able to say is your obedience is reckless. And, and I, I mentioned this earlier that I love going to these pastor things because the pastors, and these poor saps that didn't plant churches, they go into these old churches and try to resurrect them. That's a tough gig. I, could, I don't think I could do it. I think they would kick me out within the first week. The only reason that I'm still here is because I put in, the, Dave and I put in the DNA of the church to, that you would accept craziness. And, but, but the reality of it for us is, is this notion, I go to these places, and what are they, they're going through this list of horrible things, and they're terrible things, and if they were happening here, I would pull my hair out. But they're going through these things, I can't have anything, and then I, I'm just about to weep for them, and they're, they're boning, and I, I, then it gets to me, and I'm always laughing. Oh, this is going wonderfully. We're going to do this this week. we got this going on. we got this person who got saved. This person's growing in Christ. And this guy, that remember I talked about him about a year ago, he's now doing this in, in the body of Christ. It's so one of those fascinating things. It's you get to do this and you have to look at this. And why? Because the reality of it is, is the church's reputation is if you're doing the work, everybody's going to know. I don't know if you know, you're sitting in a building where a church died. And we were given the building. You're sitting in chairs from a dead church. Churches die and all their material goes to a church that's alive. Amen. That's what happens. If churches aren't about it, if they're not all in, if they're not doing it, what will happen is you will naturally, the church will naturally die. If they're not reaching out to the lost, if they're not active, if they're not invigorated, if they're not doing what God has called them to do, they're going to die. That's what happens. You'll get a core group of people that are, man, I'm committed. I'm going to ride this train, this pony all the way in. And then they get gray and they die and the church dies with them. But the reputation of this church in Rome, and I would hope that our reputation of many other churches that we're associated with, the reputation would be that of those people love Christ. They 
love Him. And they, they have loved Him so much that everything about them, it oozes out of their pores. And they, they can't help but just tell people about Christ. They can't help but just live it out. And as they seek for examples for other people, how do I live my life? How do I center it? They look and they look at you and say, that's how a Christian lives. Not that you're free from pain, not that you're free from any of the, the difficulties, not that you're free from any of that, but that you, when you hit those things, when the road bumps come up, you look to the Word of God and you pray and you hit your knees. You've heard it said, and, and I'm sure many of us have, there are Christians around the world that are under tremendous burdens. In America, oftentimes what we would pray is, God, take this burden from me. The prayer around the world is, God, strengthen my back to undergo it. To, understand, to be able to bear this burden. Saints, this burden is yours. Praise God, because it's not mine, it's yours. I handed it to you. I'm absolved of it now. But really, what we have to look at is this. Do you feel that burden for others? Do you feel the burden for the lost? Do you feel the burden in your own home? Can I lead my son to Christ? Can I lead my daughter to Christ? Do they know him? What other gift do I have for my kids? What am I going to give them that somebody else can't take? And the way the government's going, they're going to take it. <laughs> what do I have that, that somebody's not going to take? What, what can I give them? I can give them eternal life. Amen. It's God's to give. He's made, be given me the kings, keys to the kingdom. So here, hand it off to them. What, a, what, a, what better gift is that? You see, there are many things that will get in our way, many things that will distract us. Whether it be a text, whether it be life, and, and uh, saints, I understand life is distracting. Very distracting. I mean, you, you guys were here when I got called up to get activated to go and help with some stuff in the middle. That was, for me, uh, that's a great opportunity for mystery, or for mystery, ministry, for mystery too. <laughs> for ministry. Mischief. And, and mischief, yes. No, no mischief. <laughs> But we have to look at this in terms of there, there are distractions that get in the way and there are things that, that we look at this in life and, and that's going to happen. But are you so focused on Christ that when the text rings and you're headed to the store, you don't pick it up. You're so focused. I've got a mission that I'm here to accomplish. I'm going to stay focused because if I pick that up, I might crash. You see, the world and sin and the fleshly desires, the temptations will buzz your phone all day. They'll be calling you. They want you to say, hey, come on this way. But the reality of it is, is are you on mission? Are you able to stay on mission? Saints, I pray that you are because all of this is grounded in. It's all about, it's centered on Christ. Everything. You say, what else is there? As we close up the book of Romans, we read the final doxology in verse 25 of chapter 16. Now to him who is able, who is able, not yet, not yet, we're halfway through. Now to him, go ahead and order the pizza, Fred. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel through the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, Lord, truly the glory is yours. Whatever is accomplished, whatever uh, feeble tasks that we seek to accomplish, Lord, the glory goes to you. Father, as I consider the efforts of those here who are your saints, they are part of your body of believers here, the accomplishments that they engage in in their ministry, Lord, I pray that the thanks goes to you. Father, as we consider those who were here and received clothing, Lord, that, that is just a blessing that comes exclusively from you. We just get the joy of being in your toolbox being the ones that you use, that you choose to use, that you've entrusted with, with your word. To take your message of hope to a lost culture, to a lost people. Father, I pray that we would stay focused on mission. Stay focused on what it is you have for us. And Lord, that we would continue in our joy and, and love for one another and our 
joy and love for you. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.